The Desire of Ages, Chapter 30. He ordained twelve. And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him. And he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. It was beneath the sheltering trees of the mountainside, but a little distance from the Sea of Galilee, that the twelve were called to the Apostolate, and the Sermon on the Mount was given. The fields and hills were the favourite resorts of Jesus, and much of his teaching was given under the open sky, rather than in the temple or the synagogues. No synagogue could have received the throngs that followed him, but not for this reason only did he choose to teach in the fields and groves. Jesus loved the scenes of nature. To him, each quiet retreat was a sacred temple. It was under the trees of Eden that the first dwellers on earth had chosen their sanctuary. There Christ had communed with the Father of mankind. When banished from paradise, our first parents still worshipped in the fields and groves, and there Christ met them with the gospel of his grace. It was Christ who spoke with Abraham under the oaks of Mamre, with Isaac as he went out to pray in the fields at the eventide, with Jacob on the hillside at Bethel, with Moses among the mountains of Midian, and with the boy David as he watched his flocks. It was at Christ's direction that for 15 centuries the Hebrew people had left their homes for one week every year and had dwelt in booths formed from the green branches of goodly trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook. In training his disciples, Jesus chose to withdraw from the confusion of the city to the quiet of the fields and hills, as more in harmony with the lessons of self-abnegation he desired to teach them. And during his ministry, he loved to gather the people about him under the blue heavens, on some grassy hillside, or on the beach beside the lake. Here, surrounded by the works of his own creation, he could turn the thoughts of his hearers from the artificial to the natural. In the growth and development of nature were revealed the principles of his kingdom. As men should lift up their eyes to the hills of God, and behold the wonderful works of his hands, they could learn precious lessons of divine truth. Christ's teaching would be repeated to them in the things of nature. So it is with all who go into the fields with Christ in their hearts. They will feel themselves surrounded with a holy influence. The things of nature take up the parables of our Lord and repeat his counsels. By communion with God in nature, the mind is uplifted and the heart finds rest. The first step was now to be taken in the organization of the church that, after Christ's departure, was to be his representative on earth. No costly sanctuary was at their command, but the Saviour led his disciples to the retreat he loved, and in their minds the sacred experiences of that day were forever linked with the beauty of mountain and vale and sea. Jesus had called his disciples that he might send them forth as his witnesses to declare to the world what they had seen and heard of him. Their office was the most important to which human beings had ever been called and was second only to that of Christ himself. They were to be workers together with God for the saving of the world. As in the Old Testament, the 12 patriarchs stand as representatives of Israel. So the twelve apostles were to stand as representatives of the Gospel Church. The Saviour knew the character of the men whom he had chosen. All their weaknesses and errors were open before him. He knew the perils through which they must pass, the responsibility that would rest upon them, and his heart yearned over these chosen ones. Alone upon a mountain near the Sea of Galilee, he spent the entire night in prayer for them while they were sleeping at the foot of the mountain. With the first light of dawn, he summoned them to meet him, for he had something of importance to communicate to them. These disciples had been for some time associated with Jesus in active labor. John and James, Andrew and Peter, with Philip, Nathaniel and Matthew, had been more closely connected with him than the others, and had witnessed more of his miracles 
Peter, James and John stood in still nearer relationship to him. They were almost constantly with him, witnessing his miracles and hearing his words. John pressed into still closer intimacy with Jesus, so that he is distinguished as the one whom Jesus loved. The Saviour loved them all, but John's was the most receptive spirit. He was younger than the others, and with more of the child's confiding trust, he opened his heart to Jesus. Thus he came more into sympathy with Christ, and through him the Saviour's deepest spiritual teaching was communicated to his people. At the head of one of the groups into which the apostles are divided stands the name of Philip. He was the first disciple to whom Jesus addressed the distinct command, Follow me. Philip was a Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. He had listened to the teaching of John the Baptist and had heard his announcement of Christ as the Lamb of God. Philip was a sincere seeker of truth, but he was slow of heart to believe. Although he had joined himself to Christ, yet his announcement of him to Nathanael shows that he was not fully convinced of the divinity of Jesus. Though Christ had been proclaimed by the voice from heaven as the Son of God, to Philip he was Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Again, when the five thousand were fed, Philip's lack of faith was shown. It was to test him that Jesus questioned, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Philip's answer was on the side of unbelief. Two hundred pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Jesus was grieved. Although Philip had seen his works and felt his power, yet he had not faith. When the Greeks inquired of Philip concerning Jesus, he did not seize upon the opportunity of introducing them to the Saviour. But he went to tell Andrew. Again, in those last hours before the crucifixion, the words of Philip were such as to discourage faith. When Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? The Saviour answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. From Philip came the response of unbelief. Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. So slow of heart, so weak in faith, was that disciple who for three years had been with Jesus. In happy contrast to Philip's unbelief was the childlike trust of Nathaniel. He was a man of intensely earnest nature, one whose faith took hold upon unseen realities. Yet Philip was a student in the school of Christ, and the divine teacher bore patiently with his unbelief and dullness. When the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples, Philip became a teacher after the divine order. He knew whereof he spoke, and he taught with an assurance that carried conviction to the hearers. While Jesus was preparing the disciples for their ordination, one who had not been summoned urged his presence among them. It was Judas Iscariot, a man who professed to be a follower of Christ. He now came forward, soliciting a place in this inner circle of disciples. With great earnestness and apparent sincerity, he declared, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus neither repulsed nor welcomed him, but uttered only the mournful words, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Judas believed Jesus to be the Messiah, and by joining the apostles he hoped to secure a high position in the new kingdom. This hope Jesus designed to cut off by the statement of his poverty. The disciples were anxious that Judas should become one of their number. He was of commanding appearance, a man of keen discernment and executive ability, and they commended him to Jesus as one who would greatly assist him in his work. They were surprised that Jesus received him so coolly. 
The disciples had been much disappointed that Jesus had not tried to secure the cooperation of the leaders in Israel. They felt that it was a mistake not to strengthen his cause by securing the support of these influential men. If he had repulsed Judas, they would, in their own minds, have questioned the wisdom of their master. The after history of Judas would show them the danger of allowing any worldly consideration to have weight in deciding the fitness of men for the work of God. The cooperation of such men as the disciples were anxious to secure would have betrayed the work into the hands of its worst enemies. Yet, when Judas joined the disciples, he was not insensible to the beauty of the character of Christ. He felt the influence of that divine power which was drawing souls to the Saviour. He who came not to break the bruised reed, nor quench the smoking flax, would not repulse this soul while even one desire was reaching toward the light. The Saviour read the heart of Judas. He knew the depths of iniquity to which, unless delivered by the grace of God, Judas would sink. In connecting this man with himself, he placed him where he might day by day be brought into contact with the outflowing of his own unselfish love. If he would open his heart to Christ, divine grace would banish the demon of selfishness and even Judas might become a subject of the kingdom of God. God takes men as they are with the human elements in their character and trains them for his service if they will be disciplined and learn of him. They are not chosen because they are perfect, but notwithstanding their imperfections, that through the knowledge and practice of the truth, through the grace of Christ, they may become transformed into his image. Judas had the same opportunities as had the other disciples. He listened to the same precious lessons, but the practice of the truth which Christ required was at variance with the desires and purposes of Judas, and he would not yield his ideas in order to receive wisdom from heaven. How tenderly the Saviour dealt with him, who was to be his betrayer. In his teaching, Jesus dwelt upon principles of benevolence that struck at the very root of covetousness. He presented before Judas the heinous character of greed, and many a time the disciple realized that his character had been portrayed and his sin pointed out. But he would not confess and forsake his unrighteousness. He was self-sufficient, and instead of resisting temptation, he continued to follow his fraudulent practices. Christ was before him, a living example of what he must become if he reaped the benefits of the divine mediation and ministry. But lesson after lesson fell unheeded on the ears of Judas. Jesus dealt him no sharp rebuke for his covetousness, but with divine patience bore with this erring man, even while giving him evidence that he read his heart as an open book. He presented before him the highest incentives for right doing, and in rejecting the light of heaven, Judas would be without excuse. Instead of walking in the light, Judas chose to retain his defects, evil desires, revengeful passions, dark and sullen thoughts were cherished until Satan had full control of the man. Judas became a representative of the enemy of Christ. When he came into association with Jesus, he had some precious traits of character that might have been made a blessing to the church. If he had been willing to wear the yoke of Christ, he might have been among the chief of the apostles, but he hardened his heart when his defects were pointed out, and in pride and rebellion chose his own sinful ambitions, and thus unfitted himself for the work that God would have given him to do. All the disciples had serious faults when Jesus called them to his service. 
even John, who came into the closest association with the meek and lowly one, was not himself naturally meek and yielding. He and his brother were called the sons of thunder. While they were with Jesus, any slight shown to them aroused their indignation and combativeness. Evil temper, revenge, the spirit of criticism were all in the beloved disciple. He was proud and ambitious to be the first in the kingdom of God. But day by day, in contrast with his own violent spirit, he beheld the tenderness and forbearance of Jesus and heard his lessons of humility and patience. He opened his heart to the divine influence and became not only a hearer but a doer of the Savior's words. Self was hid in Christ. He learned to wear the yoke of Christ and to bear his burden. Jesus reproved his disciples. He warned and cautioned them. But John and his brethren did not leave him. They chose Jesus, notwithstanding the reproofs. The Savior did not withdraw from them because of their weakness and errors. They continued to the end to share his trials and to learn the lessons of his life. By beholding Christ, they became transformed in character. The apostles differed widely in habits and disposition. There were the publican, Levi Matthew, and the fiery zealot, Simon, the uncompromising hater of the authority of Rome, the generous, impulsive Peter, and the mean-spirited Judas. Thomas, true-hearted yet timid and fearful, Philip, slow of heart and inclined to doubt, and the ambitious, outspoken sons of Zebedee with their brethren. These were brought together with their different faults, all with inherited and cultivated tendencies to evil. But in and through Christ, they were to dwell in the family of God, learning to become one in faith, in doctrine, in spirit. They would have their tests, their grievances, their differences of opinion. But while Christ was abiding in the heart, there could be no dissension. His love would lead to love for one another. The lessons of the Master would lead to the harmonizing of all differences, bringing the disciples into unity till they would be of one mind and one judgment. Christ is the great center, and they would approach one another just in proportion as they approached the center. When Jesus had ended his instruction to the disciples, he gathered the little band close about him, and kneeling in the midst of them and laying his hands upon their heads, he offered a prayer, dedicating them to his sacred work. Thus the Lord's disciples were ordained to the gospel ministry. As his representatives among men, Christ does not choose angels who have never fallen, but human beings, men of like passions with those they seek to save. Christ took upon himself humanity, that he might reach humanity. Divinity needed humanity, for it required both the divine and the human to bring salvation to the world. Divinity needed humanity, that humanity might afford a channel of communication between God and man. So with the servants and messengers of Christ, man needs a power outside of and beyond himself to restore him to the likeness of God and enable him to do the work of God. But this does not make the human agency unessential. Humanity lays hold upon divine power. Christ dwells in the heart by faith, and through cooperation with the divine, the power of man becomes efficient for good. He who called the fishermen of Galilee is still calling men to his service, and he is just as willing to manifest his power through us as through the first disciples. However imperfect and sinful we may be, the Lord holds out to us the offer of partnership with himself 
of apprenticeship to Christ. He invites us to come under the divine instruction that uniting with Christ, we may work the works of God. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the exceeding greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. This is why the preaching of the gospel was committed to erring men rather than to the angels. It is manifest that the power which works through the weakness of humanity is the power of God. And thus, we are encouraged to believe that the power which can help others as weak as ourselves can help us. And those who are themselves compassed with infirmity should be able to have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. Having been in peril themselves, they are acquainted with the dangers and difficulties of the way, and for this reason are called to reach out for others in like peril. There are souls perplexed with doubt, burdened with infirmities, weak in faith, and unable to grasp the unseen. But a friend whom they can see, coming to them in Christ's stead, can be a connecting link to fasten their trembling faith upon Christ. We are to be labors together with the heavenly angels in presenting Jesus to the world. With almost impatient earnestness, the angels wait for our cooperation, for man must be the channel to communicate with man. And when we give ourselves to Christ in wholehearted devotion, angels rejoice that they may speak through our voices to reveal God's love.